economizing on time on my behalf. I hope you won't mind if I sit and talk, please. Um, it is said that professor is one who speaks while others fall asleep. I've been watching you. I don't think, are you professors? No. Yet people were sleeping. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Uh, but I want to start. I want to start with a caveat, Mr. Chairperson. We talked before we started, and in the course of your uh, occasional uh, interventions you were making, that what is needed is some practical things. I agree with you. But I also hold the view that nothing is more practical than a good theory. If you don't have a good theory, you cannot have good practice. So that's the whole point. Now, the organizers have asked me to address a set of five questions. And I will start with the first and how long I can go, I don't know. The first question is, could education be used as an effective countermeasure against radicalization? If yes, how? My short answer is, it depends on the type of society or polity under reference. And this calls for some elaboration. Now, it has been argued by a man called Ernest Gellner, long back in 1983, in a famous book, Nations and Nationalism, published in 1983, that modern nations are molded in their schools because students are taught through one common national language. Please underline one common national language. Similarly, the famous Kotari Commission observed India's future is shaped in her classrooms. We all know about that. Now, if these observations were correct, we could have answered the question that is asked to me and therefore to all of you in the affirmative. Gellner's observation was based on the West European experience. Usually the West European or even European countries are named after their languages. Germany, Portugal, whatever. Or in those cases it were not, for example, take United Kingdom, which is not very united. We know the Scottish problem even now. They have tried to speak the Italian language. That's called the national language. So. The kind of situation which uh, obtains in our country is radically different. And when Kotari Commission made this famous statement that India's future is shaped in our classroom, the print media was not as effective as it is today. The electronic media was uh, scarcely emerging and the social media was totally absent. Today, the education system and hence the classroom has to compete with these forces and it's not a very easy task. At any rate, India has, as you all know, 22 recognized languages and we have more than a thousand mother tongues spoken in this country, more than a thousand. And the Indian constitution through Article 351 mandates that every child should be, in, should be taught through its mother tongue. Everybody will say that every child should be taught till the age of 14, but nobody remembers that the constitutional mandate is through its mother tongue. And the language is not simply a vehicle of communication, which it is, but it is also the fulcrum of a culture complex. You start thinking about it, Every linguistic group in this country has not only have a language, but it has its own art, architecture, diet, dress, etc., etc. So, this culture complex is what the Westerners, particularly the West Europeans, refer to as nations. And what they did, Napoleon once upon a time said, for each nation its own state. So, for each nation means actually a linguistic group, they created a sovereign state. And students of political science will tell us in the year 1648 there was what is called the Treaty of Westphalia. And 
the Western nation states emerged, usually with a single language. If there were more than one languages, they were annihilated. Our trajectory is entirely different. Second, Western nation states invariably say that they are secular, but they are not. In the sense, each of them have their own officially recognized religion, in fact, denominations. I mean, the Christian group, there are three denominations, basically. The Catholic, the Orthodox, and the Protestant. And one of these will be the official churches of these. I visited the Soviet Union long ago, before the fall of the socialist regime, and we were taken to the patriarch, which is a very, very powerful person. So the church existed, even in socialist Soviet Union. And if you go to the Middle East, which are mainly Islamic or Muslim countries, one of the denominations or sectarian groups, be it Sunni or Shia, will be the officially recognized religious community. And therefore, the other group becomes instant enemy or the other, as the case may be. But India is quite different. We have, of course, the majority religion with about 82%, but we have several other religious groups with substantial demographic numbers, Muslims, Christians, and Sikhs, and smaller groups such as Buddhists, uh, Jains, Jews, Baha'is, or Austrians. So what we did, we means the constitution makers, did was to endorse the idea of secularism. Now, I can go and speak for an hour about this, because this is all said these days. In the original draft, yes, it was correct. It was not there when it was introduced, etc., etc. But that's not my point. My point is, the idea of secularism in this country meant two or three things. First, we do not have an official or national religion, in spite of the fact that we are 82% Hindus. That's one. Secondly, the idea of onward march of rationalism, which Pandit Nehru usually referred to as the scientific temper. He said that needs to be, <clears throat> you see, the moment I talk about scientific temper, technology fails us. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I hope uh, it uh, will have uh, its uh, counter. We have Jugaad technology already. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm not, please, I'm not uh, suggesting for a moment that Indian state was ever secular. It wasn't. Again, I can talk for hours on that, but that's not our subject. But I want to suggest to you that a secular society is a conceptual nullity. No society can ever be a secular society. A secular state is a possibility, but it is not happening. So, what I am trying to tell you is, that in any society, there were believers, religious people, there were atheists, rationalists, agnostics, etc., etc. So, if you take that position, we do not have a religion which can really be called official or national. We have something like 22 languages which are recognized and many which are not recognized. That means not put into the eighth schedule. This being so, India cannot be called a nation state. That's my first point, because the kind of education that we should have will have to be different from the kind of education that you will have in nation state in Europe, which would be singular in character. Now, if that be so, how can we answer the question, can education be an antidote to radicalization, because if we have multiple religions, if we have multiple languages, we will have necessarily multiple educational systems. We can't escape that. In addition to the idea of a nation state, which is certainly a European idea, which unfortunately the rest of the world have taken, I say unfortunately, there are good reasons for that. If somebody wants to ask me at the time of questions, I will. <coughs> Uh, respond to that. There is another European idea which is very unfortunate. That is the much celebrated enlightenment idea. What does it mean? 
the enlightenment idea really thought of inventing it, it invented universal human beings <coughs> who by definition transcend all primordial ties religious linguistic <coughs> nationality etc and what was the context of that and that's also very interesting see when i talk even the technology is failing me i don't know you have done something against me <coughs> is he i referred to the treaty of westphalia it was in 1648 but this what i am referring to the enlightenment idea has its origin in 1789 when in alsace in france the clown of caramon tone declared and i quote the jews should be denied everything as a nation but granted everything as individuals what was the rationale for this the rationale was if jews have allegiance to themselves they will make a community and if they make a community then their terminal loyalty will not be to the state of france so individuals as it were in the mass and there is a sovereign state there is a direct linkage there are no intermediary structures in between now this is untenable in this country because we are hundreds of groups in between it may be sometimes linguistic well religious caste we may all say that these are bad but we cannot wish them away they are realities and therefore i've been telling for some years india is not a nation state as we understand in the case of west europe but it is a national state what is a national state a national state is one in which diversity is respected and recognizing diversity is one of the important aspects of uh, what we call secularism and this is not mine since we are on education let me bring to your attention a document which is called national curriculum framework for school education this was published in the year 2000 when india 1 was in power this is very important today things have changed and what did the document say the document says that one of the important values of this country is secularism along with equality democracy fraternity etc and it has identified the document three pillars of indian education one relevance relevance of education for the country for the society two equity and three excellence so it uh, really highlights the importance of uh, modern education system modern education as instrument of uh, moderating the differences between caste religion and gender most importantly it points to the danger of and please underline this propagating rituals dogmas and superstitions through educational institutions invoking religion are we really, really listening to these things this is a document i said uh, published in 2000 ad and it concludes india is a multicultural multilingual and multi religious society every region and state has its unique identity incidentally if you have seen the document called indian constitution the first sentence is in yes <laughs> I mean, if you read that, much of this uh, controversies will look very stupid. Therefore, the document that I am referring to emphasizes the need for a plurality of pedagogy, which contextualizes the teaching-learning uh, system, taking into account the specificities. Again, the document says of tribal Adivasi, peasant, and urban settlements, as well as. religious and linguistic groups why i am saying this the among the kinds of questions that is given one question is should be really encourage accept a religious seminaries in our country yes but what kind of education goes on there will have to be looked into each religion will have its own right 
to, to believe and according to the constitution even propagate his own religion. But please also remember, in spite of the fact that India is such a huge country with such diversity of population, we have single citizenship. In the United States of America, you have two citizenship. I lived in California some years, so I had to fill up two forms, one for California, the other for the federal state. We don't have to do it. We have single citizenship and that is the overarching thrust. So on the one hand, we have a single citizenship idea. On the other, we have multiplicity of cultures and we have to uh, negotiate between these two and therefore the idea of a uniform, uh, universal citizenship as found uh, in the enlightenment idea is simply not applicable, even if we want to. Therefore, education can play a positive role in containing or preventing radicalization only if we have consensus, not necessarily unanimity, on the idea of India. And this is again something which is discussed so frequently, the idea of India. At least there are four competing ideas of India if you go through the available literature on the subject. First, I'll simply mention that and leave it there. First, cultural monism. One set of people say that India will have to be seen as one nation, one culture, one people. Yes, we are a people in the sense that there is uniform citizenship. All India citizenship. We are one people as citizens. But not as religious people, not as linguistic people, not as people who dress in the same manner or eat the same kind of food. I keep on asking my students in the club, class, can you identify one factor where all Indians would be following one, only one, except in citizenship, there is nothing. So we are an utterly diverse society and we must accept that fact. So the first idea of India is cultural monism and if you look at the empirical reality, we are culturally plural, culturally diverse. The second idea of India uh, arose in order to grapple with the danger of homogenization. Because somebody mentioned, I think you mentioned to uh, a document of uh, the RSS vintage. That started much before independence because a Hindu Rashtra was uh, <coughs> conceptualized and that is why cultural monism comes. As an antidote to that, in order to prevent cultural homogenization, the idea of cultural pluralism was uh, floated. In my reading, the ideas such as unity in diversity, composite culture, etc., etc., were all floated at a time, if you go through historical writings, to avoid partition. But that has not happened. We got divided for good or bad reasons. Again, I cannot go into that. So, in terms of our practices, as I already said, we don't have an official religion. We have 22 languages. We have so many varieties of food practices. If you go to France, you must all know what is a French cuisine. But is there an Indian cuisine? Please tell me. No. There is a Gujarati cuisine. There is a Rajasthani cuisine. There is a Tamil cuisine, etc. There is no Indian cuisine. Is there an Indian dress? No. So. We have to accept the fact that we are a multicultural society. So that's the second idea of India. India as a culturally plural entity. Three, the third idea is India as a cultural federation or a coalition. Actually, this idea was planted by when uh, Tagore formulated his... Uh, national anthem. You start thinking about it, then you will see all these will be there, Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat. Of course, Sindh is no more with us. Punjab is divided, Bengal is divided. Again, I cannot go into that. So, he had, Gurudev has a certain idea of India, which was a culturally federal entity. He did not talk about Hindi. He did not talk about Hinduism. But he again talked about a variety of cultures. So the third idea of India is that it is a cultural federalism. 
I'm not referring to the political federalism, but political federalism is required because of cultural federalism, and it is also related to the linguistic reorganization of India in 1956, etc., etc. But none of these, that is, cultural monism, cultural pluralism, and cultural federalism is acceptable or accepted by the majority of the people in this country. And that idea I refer to as cultural subalternism. Who are the subalterns in this country? Mainly three groups. First, the scheduled caste or Dalits, 15%. Second, the Adivasis or scheduled tribes, 8%. And third, the OBCs, 52%, together constituting 75%. Now, if you read available literature of what is India, you will find a counter to all the first three, which are actually elite formulations, have come into view. And therefore, we can or we have to accept that there is a cultural subalternist perspective about India. They say, well, none of these is really describing us and our way of life. And we are 75% of the country. Now, these are the four competing perspective perspectives about the idea of India. And what are these? Identity, dignity, security, and equity. So IDSE, the three, the four things together, it's like maybe a good idea, isn't it? So IDSE, we are not thinking about India in that sense. Somebody will think India is Hindu, this, that, and the other. Others will think it is a multicultural, which it is, but more than all this, we must think in terms of an entity called identity, which is having identity, dignity, security, and equity. Now I come to the last part. How many minutes I have? Five? Five. <clears throat> How do we then moderate, if not eliminate, radicalization in India? As I said, there are three essential steps. First, avoid attempts at homogenization of culture. Anybody who is attempting to homogenize culture, Indian cultures, will certainly have to pay a very high price in terms of radicalization. A lot of problem is this attempt at homogenization of culture, people will respond and they will respond in very many ways. Sometimes they will shoot you after calling you for a dinner, as happened in California the other day. Please remember. So, cultural diversity always existed in India. It's nothing new. But what is important is the attitude towards that cultural diversity, which I call cultural pluralism. Therefore, if you want to eliminate radicalization, we must systematically cultivate cultural pluralism, which means Dignity to, dignity to other cultures. Two, stop totalization of religion. What do I mean by totalization of religion? Now, I don't think that a society will ever exist from which religion is exorcised. It is not an empirical possibility. However, what I mean by totalization is linking religion with non-religious things, language. We always think that Sanskrit is inextricably intertwined with Aryan Hinduism, Tamil with Dravidian Hinduism, Urdu with subcontinental Islam, Pali with Buddhism, etc., etc. Oh, Punjabi written in, uh, <clears throat> in Gurumukhi with Sikhism, etc., etc. Now, this idea of linking religion and language it's an aspect of what I call totalization. Similarly, linking medical systems, Ayurveda, Yunani, Allopathy, Tibetan. If you really know the history of these medical systems, it has nothing to do with religion. And it works. I'm a great believer in uh, Ayurveda because I benefited out of it. It has nothing to do with religion. Some people object to yoga. How stupid. Such a wonderful thing. But why should necessarily be related to a religion? I don't understand. 
So that's my point. Never try to totalize religion or think in terms of legal systems. Each religion is trying to project that we have a monopoly of a particular legal system. No. We have at least three legal systems in this country. One, religious legal systems. These days we are talking about uniform civil code, etc. Again, very fascinating. I wish Harish Salve would have been here. Now, there are certain historical reasons. But we have, in addition to that, religious legal systems. We have folk legal systems. The tribal communities, the peasant communities have their own legal systems. After all, before modern state arose, there was customs. Custom was the king. And what we call uh, uh, the legal system today mainly are customary practices, formalized. But on the top of all these, we have what is called a state legal system, SLS. And that is what contained in the Constitution. So we have competing legal systems because of cultural pluralism. I am very fond of saying that cultural diversity will beget legal pluralism. If in a country everybody is a Muslim, everybody is uh, speaking a particular language, etc., etc., you don't need that plurality of uh, religious systems. So, we have a state legal system with overwhelming importance and all India uh, rich, but there are also legal systems which are specific to particular communities. But don't try to encapsulate those into the religious context. That's my second. Avoid totalization of religion. Three, reject territorialization of religion. What do I mean by territorialization of religion? Actually, as far as I know, you can correct me later, if you want, only two religions really insist on what I call territorialization of religion. Judaism and Hinduism. We say that, well, this part of the world on planet Earth is given to us by God, as the Jews will believe, and they went to establish a state with all its consequences. And we are imitating them in a way when we say that Hinduism is the sole religion of this, with its additions, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism are all Hindu, according to that understanding. Again, I will not go into the, the, the details. Any territory which is identified as the ancestral homeland of a particular religion is a sure invitation for radicalization. It will happen, you can take it for me. And that is what is happening. And on the other end of the continuum, I would say the deterritorialization of state. State as an institution cannot be conceived without a territory. All of us who read some uh, textbooks in political science would say the first condition is territory, then population, then sovereignty, etc., etc. Now here is a group of people who come to believe that the state can exist independent of a territory, it is universal. Of course, there is a link with this idea and the notion of Ummah, universal community. It is wonderful to have an Ummah, in the sense a group of people, I and mean, this is the Islamic belief, a group of people who believe in the same God, having a brotherhood, whether you are in Africa, Antarctica, or India, fine enough. But that does not mean that. That people constitute a state. It's a stupid, unworkable idea. But that seemed to be a big threat to us and leading to radicalization. Now, friends, uh, I want to relieve you of uh, the agony of listening to me. Uh, I, normally <laughs> I normally start by saying that uh, they are victims. But, but, at that, but at that time, I will be lecturing for an hour. This is a mere 20 minutes that the, the chair has uh, permitted me. So, if you do these three things, you can think in terms of avoiding radicalization. But 
these things will have to be taught in our educational institutions. Educational institution does not have the kind of autonomy that we fancy. Ultimately, it is the state, the society, which determines what should be happening in educational institution. And therefore, to pursue these objectives of radicalization, we should modernize. By modernization, at the moment, I mean only two things. One, structural differentiation. It's a technical term, but let me use it. Structural differentiation only means that certain structures are endowed to do certain things. State is a structure. Religious community is a structure, etc., etc. So, thou shalt do thy work. The state should not get into and get murky by taking on the role of church or temple or mosque and vice versa. That is one aspect of modernization. The other is the onward march of rationality. Now, I don't want to tell you what has been happening in the recent months when people claim that everything was in India, whether it is Pushpak Viman, of course, it's all a matter of imagination, or plastic surgery. We don't need anything from anywhere. Everything was here. Now, this is very sad. And this is the surest way of inviting radicalization. Because when you do this, there will be a counter narrative. Please avoid that. And we have every reason to be optimistic because I think the vast majority of Indians, even today, are sane people. Thank you very much.